Falcon Exports. Terry nodded to the security guard at the front entrance of the embassy doors. He walked quickly down the hall past the receptionist's desk, the royal portrait of the Queen and the maple leaf flag. The reading room was almost deserted. Only three other people were sitting at the long wooden table. He went over their newspaper rack and selected the Vancouver Sun, Toronto Telegram, Montreal Star, and the Hamilton Spectator. During his stay in London, he came to the Canadian Embassy about once a week to keep in touch with events happening back home. He read the Hamilton Spectator last and was almost finished when he noticed a three-line story on the back pages. It said simply that Peter S., age 26, had been arrested for possession of marijuana. It said further that his trial was of four days or three days previously since the paper Terry was reading was a week old. Terry put down the paper and sank back in the leather chair. The silence in the room was deafening. He forcibly restrained himself from shouting. He experienced a wide variety of emotions in quick succession. Shock because it was completely unsuspected, pain because Peter was a good friend of his, and somewhat guiltily relief because his responsibilities were over. The story began three months previously in Hamilton. Terry had been dealing then. He knew he was being watched by the police, but was cautious enough to avoid them. Still, a sixth sense told him he was being enmeshed in a net, and the trap was closing quickly. He decided to leave for Europe until things cooled down. Peter met him in a restaurant and handed him $400. Terry agreed to send Ashish back from North Africa, timing the shipment to coincide with the Christmas mail rush to minimize the risk of it being intercepted. He went to Montreal and New York first, then flew to Luxembourg. He hitchhiked through Germany, Switzerland, Italy, and France. He took a train through Spain, and it was in a third-class coach heading south from Madrid that he met his first contact. He was an Arab in his late twenties who introduced himself as Mohammed Ben Lala. Mohammed recognized a mutual interest in marijuana and reve revealed that he earned his living smuggling keef from Morocco to France, Holland, and Germany. Terry revealed the purpose of his visit to Morocco was to buy quantity hashish. Mohammed said there was no hashish in Morocco, there was only keef, and his brother-in-law grew the best. He pointed out that his hometown, Tetuan, had far fewer tourists than Tangiers, and accordingly sold their keef much cheaper. He invited Terry to spend a couple of days as his guest at Tetuan. Terry agreed, but insisted he would buy only hashish because it was easier to ship and more profitable to sell. Then he tried to sleep to the jarring of the train. In third class, the benches are wooden and hard. The countryside was getting drier, and there is a noticeable increase in Moorish influence in the architecture. They reached Al Sergius that evening and shared an inexpensive room in a hotel near the waterfront. Muhammad talked ceaselessly about his country and his experiences in Europe. Terry listened, but was too tired by the long train journey from Marseille to ask questions. In the morning they walked down to the docks and peeled a banana and an orange for breakfast before they boarded the ferry for Sitta. The Mediterranean was blue and calm. They stood at the iron railing at the ship, stern of the ship watching the seagulls of the ship, dive bomb for scraps of garbage thrown through the galley porthole. It took several hours to complete the crossing. Terry moved to the bow of the ship and waited with anticipation. He felt a tingling in his veins. For the moment he had left Europe behind and the mysterious green continent of Africa awaited him. At last he made out the shoreline and tall elegant date palms of Spanish Morocco. They disembarked and went through a superficial customs check, although this territory was still legally a colony of Spain. Terry expected to take a bus, which was the cheapest form of transportation. Mohammed Ben Lala refused vehemently, as he would be losing face, and insisted they share a taxi with four other passengers. The pride of the East proved stronger than the economy of the West, and Terry reluctantly agreed. It was only a short drive to Moroccan Customs where Terry got another stamp in his passport and changed some traveler's checks to Durham currency. They changed taxis and sped along the asphalt highway into the hills. The green belt along the shores of the Mediterranean was now a long ways behind them. 
The hills were sparse and dry and ru uh, rust colored. The only vegetation consisted of sparse tufts of grass and isolated thorn bushes. Muhammad nudged his arm. These hills are the beginning of the Moyan Atlas range, he said proudly. It was stifling hot in the car. The windows were kept closed to protect the passengers from dust. They sweated uncomfortably, and the interior of the cab took on a distinct smell. Even Ben Lola, who talked incessantly, lapsed into silence. The next five hours they stopped only once, so the men could relieve, relieve themselves by the side of the road. They reached Tetuan in the late afternoon. They paid off the driver, and Terry followed Bahama to the inner city. They passed under a stone archway and entered the welcome shade of the Casbah. The streets here were only six feet wide, large enough for a mule, but certainly not a, not a car. They were covered overhead with the same mud brick motor as the buildings on either side, and only an occasional beam of sunlight seeped through. The pavement was rough cobblestone worn into the dust. Terry immediately became lost in the twisted maze of alleyways and placed, it, placed full trust in Muhammad as his guide. They walked for at least ten minutes, and Terry guessed they must be getting close, for Ben Lala was now verbally welcomed by all the children and shopkeepers he met. Finally, Ben Lala motioned to an entrance in the wall. To the left, there was a circular, circular staircase and a small shelter to the right which stank of urine. This is the washroom, Ben Lola indicated expectantly. Terry must have looked dubious, for Ben Lola added, It's our custom here to put the bathroom at the entrance to the house. Terry laughed and pissed against the wall. It's a good custom, he agreed, as they climbed the staircase. He remembered how many times he had gone to someone's house in Canada and sat uncomfortably on a couch. Being shy, reluctant to ask where the washroom was. When they reached the top of the stairs, Muhammad asked him to wait. In a few moments, he returned and guided Terry to an inner room where an old man sat on a cushion. My grandfather, Muhammad said dutifully. Salam alaikum, Terry greeted him with the traditional Arab welcome Muhammad had taught him aboard the train. Alaikum salam, the old man replied with a bow. He then talked to Muhammad sharply and sounded Terry like an argument. He noticed that the old man was toothless and had a cataract in one eye. After a brief discussion, the old man seemed to give in, and Terry was led to yet another room. In this room, the walls were bare, but the floor carpeted and near, neatly covered with soft, bulky cushions. Muhammad turned on a battered radio set and excused himself. Terry sat cross-legged on the cushions, listening to the rhythmic chanting of Arab music. It was interrupted by a newscast in their native language. There was heavy static, and all Terry could make out was the word Tangier. When Muhammad returned, he was wrapped in a loosely folded striped robe. He sat cross-legged on a cushion opposite Terry and produced a pipe and leather pouch of keef. My sister will bring us tea, he announced with a smile. The pipe was about a foot long and a quarter inch in diameter. The stem was wooden and notched with rings. The tiny bowl was baked from red clay. It was filled with keef, and he handed it to Terry, who lit it. Immediately colors brightened, and the music seemed distant and far away. Muhammad smiled, smoked a pipe himself, and handed it back to Terry. By the time the tea arrived, both of them were thoroughly stoned. It was brought in a silver teapot and a silver tray. The circular tray had finely etched mandala patterns, which left Terry hypnotized. Mint tea is our national beverage, Muhammad's voice spoke out of the clouds. Keef dries the throat, but tea refreshes it. Terry took the cup in his hands. It tasted like mint and was hot and heavily sugared. Very good, he grinned, and so is the keef. Muhammad gave him the pipe and the pouch of marijuana as a gift. Etiquette demanded that Terry give him a gift in return, and he chose a fairly new shirt from his battered suitcase. Muhammad was pleased. He guided Terry to a hotel in the main quarter, and they agreed to meet later that evening. Ben Lula showed up sharply at nine o'clock, and they took a taxi to a mud brick dwelling on the outskirts of Tetuan. It was similar in structure to Muhammad's place in the Kasba, but more simply furnished. He was introduced to a bearded man named Akbar Halim. Muhammad acted as interpreter. 
The best quality keef, they said, showing him two plastic bags of marijuana weighing about a pound and a half each. Terry inspected them, testing and smoking a sample to ascertain its quality. How much? he asked curiously. Twenty-five dollars a kilo, Muhammad replied confidently. Terry nodded. He wasn't familiar with Moroccan prices, but compared to the Canadian market at four hundred dollars a kilo, twenty-five seemed very reasonable. It's good, he admitted, but I'm not interested in keef, only hashish. I have to export this, and keef is too bulky. There is no hashish in Morocco, Muhammad protested. You are my friend, believe me. Terry shook his head. I'm sorry. If you have no hashish, I must go to Tangiers. Wait, Muhammad offered. We will convert it to hashish. Very heavy and small, I promise you. How much do you want? Terry smiled. Five kilos. It was ready two days later. Muhammad came to his hotel room to make sure that everything was okay and then disappeared. In ten minutes, he was back with the suitcase. He opened it up and spread the contents out on the bed. Terry picked up a piece and looked at it curiously. It weighed about a pound and was saucer-shaped like certain brands of Dutch cheese. There are ten pieces in all, each piece individually wrapped in heavy white cloth. He opened one up and smelt it. It was still fresh and warm. Okay, he agreed. He lifted up his mattress and took out his wallet he had hidden under there. He quickly counted out a hundred and twenty dollars in American bills. Muhammad took the money eagerly. He then produced a small bag. I have brought you some candy. It is called Majun and it is made from keef. Terry tasted it. It was of the sweetness and consistency of fudge. How much? No charge, Muhammad said as if offended. But perhaps we could trade. Terry offered him a shirt, but he already had too many shirts. Do you have a watch? He hinted. I have a watch, Terry agreed, but it's of no use. It doesn't work any more. Let me see, Muhammad said eagerly. He inspected it carefully. Terry took a bus to Tangiers and found a cheap room in the Kasbah. It was called the Hotel Wazan and cost him the Canadian equivalent of 75 cents a day. It was a large room, but simply furnished with a bed, a table, and chair. A glaring light bulb hung from the ceiling. There was a fan, but he rarely used it since the weather was decidedly cooler on the Atlantic coast. It was mid-November, which left him approximately three weeks to figure out a way to ship the hashish. It was a tougher problem than he had anticipated. For one thing, five kilos was much bulkier than he expected. For another thing, there was an outgoing customs check at the Tangiers post office. This alone doubled the risk he was taking. He spent some time in the new city looking around tourist shops for suitable containers for export. He couldn't find anything safe enough to preclude discovery. Most of the time he spent in his hotel room smoking keef or and on daily walks through the Kasbah. The old city fascinated him with its narrow passageways and twisting alleys. Here the coppersmiths and blacksmiths practiced their trade exactly as in biblical times, squatting on their heels in front of an open fire. Nightfall came quickly, and with it the cold. Men and women alike wore jebelas, think thick monk-like robes with a cowl over the head to shut out the wind. They were dark, mysterious figures sliding through passageways. Only when he was close enough to see whether they wore a veil or not could he tell if they were a man or a woman. Occasionally he ate couscous, a popular meat and vegetable stew at a cafe, but for the most part Arabic dishes were too spicy for him, and he preferred to buy dates, bananas, and oranges from the vendors and eat in his room. He often went to cafes, but only to smoke keef and drink repetitive cups of the hot sugared mint tea. Sometimes he joined a group of Arabs at a table, and was accustomed to use only one pipe and pass it in a circle. Brown fingers would scoop loose and seedless keef into a bowl and light it with a match. Terry's lungs were underdeveloped compared to his companions, and he could only smoke half a pipe at a time. At first he would pass a still-burning pipe to the man beside him, but it was persistently refused. Later he learned that etiquette demanded each man have a fresh pipeful. Finished or not, they would turn the bowl upside down and blow either ashes or embers onto the floor. 
There was a very popular meeting place called the Dancing Boy Cafe, which had a live band. Women were not allowed to entertain in public, so like the Elizabethan actors of historical England, they used young boys, whose voice and features had not yet coarsened. The bad members played flute and drums and weird wind instruments he had never seen before. The boy was very lithe and feminine. His voice was shrill and clear. Watching his agile and sensual dance, Terry understood for the first time why the incidence of homosexuality was so high in the Arab culture. On this particular night, he met a Dutchman who was leaving soon for Amsterdam. The topic of conversation drifted around to drugs and smuggling. As Terry explained his position, the Dutchman listened attentively. On this particular night, he met a Dutchman who was leaving soon for Amsterdam. The topic of conversation drifted around to drugs and smuggling. As Terry explained his position, the Dutchman listened attentively, then offered a suggestion. I know an Arab called Tetuan Tustar. He supplied me with a false bottom suitcase. Perhaps he can help you. I'm leaving tomorrow, but I'll introduce you this evening, if you wish. Terry readily agreed. They walked to an old house in the Kasbah district, and the Dutchman knocked on the door. It was opened slightly, and the Dutchman whispered softly. A moment later, they were led upstairs to a room. It was decorated in traditional Arab style of carpet and cushions, but it was much more opulent than anything he had seen before. Tetuan Tustar was in his early thirties. He was a handsome man with curly black hair and a pencil mustache. He was smartly dressed in a western suit and spoke perfect English. Don't worry, he assured the Dutchman. A friend of yours is a friend of mine. He winked knowingly at Terry. Hans and I have done business before. He clapped his hands and a servant brought a hookah which he filled with blonde Lebanese hashish. They smoked in silence, chatting occasionally about incidental topics, but for the moment deliberately avoiding the subject of business. I gather you had something particular in mind when you came to see me, he said with twinkling eyes. Terry paused for a second then decided to be perfectly frank. I have five kilos of fish, which I, I'm going to mail to North America. I'd like your advice on how to do it. Tetuan nodded. You came to the right man. There are only two of us in Tangiers who specialize in such affairs, and I am the more honest of the two, he added with a charming smile. But first a question. Where did you buy the hashish, and how much did you pay for it? I bought it in Tetuan at $25 a kilo. Tetuan, he said in surprise. As you might guess from my name, it was the town I was born in. But if you paid only $25 a kilo, it could not possibly be hashish. It was Keith, Terry admitted. I had them compress it so it would be easier to send and darken its color so it would have a better market value. I was told there is no hashish in Morocco. Tetuan laughed. That's partly true. There is hashish in Tangiers, of course, but it is imported from Turkey and Lebanon and is therefore expensive. Still, you are going to much trouble and risk. Why not sell your keef here and buy good quality hashish to export? How much, Terry queried. $150 a kilo, Tetuan said calmly. T Terry smiled. Impossible. I have very little money left. Tetuan shrugged his shoulders. Very well. He cracked his knuckles thoughtfully and Terry noticed a large diamond ring. I think it's too dangerous to mail it from Morocco. If it has not caught at customs at this end, it will surely be inspected carefully in America because of its origins. Terry nodded in agreement, but what alternative is there? Tretton smiled confidently. If I were you, I would carry it myself to England. There should be no difficulty mailing it from there. Terry turned the idea over in his head. It would be risky. Tetuan shrugged his shoulders. There is always risk. If you wish, I will make you a false bottom suitcase like I did for Hans. It should get you into England. Terry nodded. I'll think about it. Good, Tetuan replied. Now let's put our minds at rest and smoke until contentment. He refilled the hookah and ordered his servant to bring tea. Terry didn't see him again for over a week. Life in the Kasba carried on as usual. He spent a lot of time walking along the beach watching the cold gray Atlantic. He got to know the manager of the hotel and his family. Like most Arabs, they spoke no English but knew a little French. 
Terry also knew a little French and found they could communicate surprisingly well in the second language. Perhaps it was because both of them had learned a similar basic vocabulary, or perhaps it was only that they spoke slower and had more patience with each other. In the meantime, Terry was doing some heavy thinking about Tetuan's advice. The problems were numerous, and the possibility of his spending the next few years in prison extremely likely. In a way, he was tempted to shelve the whole project, but that would mean letting down Peter, who was depending on him. Besides, he had already spent the money entrusted to him. Time was running out. One night, he went back to Tetuan, who welcomed him as an old friend. I've been wondering what happened to you, he said with a smile. I've been thinking about your suggestion, Terry admitted. Have you come to a decision, he asked, filling the hookah? Yes, I want you to build me a suitcase. I brought you a sample, he said, bringing out one large block from under his jacket. Tetuan unwrapped the cloth, inspected it carefully. It will have to be broken down into powder, he said slowly, and then sealed in plastic so dogs cannot smell. He looked at Terry and grinned. I can fit three kilos into one suitcase. But I bought five kilos, Terry objected. Tetuan frowned. You forget my risk. You're not the only one who takes risks. I do as well. More than three kilos will make the suitcase too heavy, and customs will become suspicious. Terry spread his hands in appeasement. It will be as you say. I trust your judgment. Tetuan smiled and lit the hookah. It will cost ten dollars for the suitcase and ten dollars for my labor. It will be necessary for you to bring the key here. It must be broken down and repacked before the suitcase is sealed. Terry was naturally reluctant to hand over the hashish and leave it there, but he was assured by Tetuan he could be present when the suitcase was sealed. He delivered the key as instructed and waited for Tetuan's call. It came two days later when Tetuan's servant knocked on the door and escorted him through the kasbah. Terry waited impatiently for the ritual of the hookah and tea to end so they could get down to business. Is it ready? he asked expectantly. Tetuan smiled. It is ready. He clapped his hands, and the servant brought a large suitcase of imitation zebra skin into the room. He opened it with a flourish. I will explain to you how it was done. First, a layer of strong glue was applied to the inside. To this was stuck the keef wrapped lightly, tightly in plastic. Another layer of glue was added to the plastic, and then the interior fitting added to this. He paused. See? It is almost impossible to detect. Terry felt disappointment and frustration rise inside of him. You said I could be present when it was sealed, he said accusingly. How do I know you put the keef inside and not something else? Tetuan fought hard to control his anger, but his eyes flashed dangerously. My servant sealed it by mistake. If you wish, we shall open it now to prove my honesty, but the suitcase would be ruined. You must pay me regardless. Terry hesitated. He was afraid of being made a fool of. The circumstances were suspicious, yet he did test Tetuan, and the final analysis would be forced to trust him. I'm sorry, he apologized, produced a $20 bill from his pocket. I accept your apology, Tetuan said coolly. He took the $20 bill and filled the hookah. Perhaps it would be best if you didn't carry through your plan. I will offer to buy your key for the price you paid for it. You are young and impulsive. I do not want to see you hurt. Terry grinned. The suitcase is well made. I'll be okay. If you are going directly to England, I would not worry. But if you go by land, you must first enter Spain. We have been making suitcases for many years in Tangiers. The Spaniards know this. It's a matter of chance whether you are caught or... And if you are, you will spend six years in the dungeon. Not even your embassy can help you there. I can't afford to go by plane or sea. I must go by land. Don't worry. If I'm caught, I will say nothing. Tetuan refilled the hookah. I will pray to Allah for you. Both finances and time demanded that Terry leave immediately. He gave a kilo of key free to a startled American who had just arrived from New York. He gave his pipe and pouch and the rest of the key to Mahoud, the manager of his hotel. He left his knapsack with Tetuan. That afternoon he bought some souvenirs to send his parents for Christmas and got a short haircut in the new city. He regretted losing his long curls, but realized it would increase his chances of reaching London safely. The next morning, he said goodbye to Tangier and took the ferry to El Sergius. He was fortunate. When he arrived at customs, they were preoccupied with taking apart a Volkswagen bus, and he was waved through without incident. He ate beef tech and pommes frites at a Spanish restaurant while awaiting the departure of the next train to Madrid. 
From there, he caught a train direct to Paris. It wound slowly through the Pyrenees, then gathered speed in France. It took 48 hours from the time he left Alcer Diaz until he arrived in Paris at Le Sudgara. He had to take a taxi from the southern terminal to the northern terminal. Here he put the suitcase in a baggage locker and decided to spend four or five hours exploring the city. It was his first time in Paris. He was as amazed by the people and the quaintness of the city as any ordinary tourist. It was the first week of December and the city was covered with freshly fallen snow. He walked until his feet were numb and went into a restaurant to order a croissant and café au lait. When he went downstairs to the men's washroom, he was surprised to find a lady concierge in a glass booth who demanded 30 centimes before she'd let him use the toilet. Eventually, he wound up sitting with a group of tramps under a bridge along the Seine. They ate roasted chestnuts and drank coffee while stamping their feet and warming their hands over a charcoal fire. The same day, he got the train to Calais and got on the ferry to Dover. He stood at the railing near the bow of the ship, buffeted by a northern wind. He was smoking nervously in spite of the wind and felt queasy when the deck lurched beneath his feet. The channel was rough. White foam capped the cold Atlantic waves. Seagulls were suspended along the chalk-shrouded cliffs. When they reached Dover, Terry walked down the gangplank, suitcase in hand. The imitation zebra swirls looked strangely out of place amongst the dark tan leather. The corridor the passengers walked down was split into three lines, English, Commonwealth, and foreigners. Terry joined the Commonwealth line and produced his passport when asked to by immigration authorities. North Africa, the uniform smiled. How much money do you have? He watched as Terry produced a five-pound note and ten shillings. Is that all? Terry nodded. It's all the change I have. Traveler's checks? No. Sorry, son, I can't let you in. The ground spun beneath his feet. It was a situation he hadn't prepared for. His mind raced, searching for the right words. Listen, he pleaded. My parents have sent me a check care of general delivery at the post office. The immigration officer shrugged his shoulders. Sorry, you don't qualify financially for entry. You can't live long in London on $12. I'll, even, I'll have even less by the time I pay passage back to France. My money will be waiting in London, Terry argued. How am I going to live in Paris? What if they don't let me back into France? The immigration officer looked at him studiously, noting he had short hair and was fairly well dressed. Well, at least you have a suitcase instead of a knapsack. I guess I believe you. He grinned and stamped Terry's passport. Terry exhaled with relief. At least the first obstacle was over with. He walked nervously up to the counter over which the sign spelling customs hung from the ceiling. Put it up here, the officer said, patting the counter. Terry did as he was instructed, and the officer opened the clasps. Where are you coming from? Morocco. Any marijuana to declare, he said jokingly. No, Terry said quickly. He involuntarily gasped as the officer opened the lid. He had carefully cut his hair and left behind his pipe and everything that would indicate he used drugs, yet lying right out in the open was a book by Alan Watts. The title was LSD in bright red, green, and yellow. Terry had a sinking feeling in his stomach. The officer's face hardened. You use this crap? he asked without expecting an answer. Fred, he called to a co-worker. Give me a hand. Then he turned again to Terry. I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you have anything to declare? No, Terry said defiantly. Only a silver teapot and leather cushion, which are duty-free gifts. Empty your pockets, the officer ordered. Terry obeyed and submitted to search, while watching the other officer take each item out of the suitcase one by one and carefully examine it. Even his jeans and sweater, in case he had rolled a joint or two up in the cuffs. At last, the suitcase was empty. Amazingly enough, they never had lifted it off the counter to feel its weight or used the pin test to gauge its thickness. Okay, put everything back. Continue down the corridor, the officer mumbled. Terry quickly repacked the suitcase and boarded the train for London. As he sat down in his seat, he nervously lit one of the Galois cigarettes he had bought in Paris. The hand which held the match was shaking. To his surprise, he began to cry. Not loudly, but a few moist tears rolled down his cheeks. He wasn't in the habit of praying, but he thanked God for letting him pass through safely. That night he ate fish and chips and drank a sixpenny tea. 
He took a hotel room near Victoria Station and, exhausted by the continuous train journey from Morocco, slept soundly for the first time in three days. In the morning, he felt exhilarated and confident. This, despite the fact he had approximately four dollars to his name. His immediate problem was finding a place to stay until he got an answer from Peter. He had sent Peter a letter from Tangiers informing him he was going to London and according to a prearranged code inquired after his health. If Peter answered he was well he would send the shipment immediately to a predetermined address. If Peter answered he was ill Terry would know something had gone wrong and wait for further instructions. He found himself in Chelsea buying an underground newspaper called the International Times. He went inside a pub for a pint of beer. Leafing through the paper, he realized that the hippie village seemed to be concentrated in Ladbroke Grove. An advertisement gave the address of a head shop on Bl Blenheim Crescent. He figured it was as good a place to start as any. Terry found the easiest, in fact the only way he could find his way around London was by the tube station charts. The underground had been built long before the war and looked as battered and worn out as New York's. London itself was drab and grey. The buildings were worn and repetitive. Many of them were derelict and boarded up. The head shop specialized in underground magazines, posters, incense and pipes. Terry told the clerk he had just come from Tangiers with three kilos of keef. By evening he was invited to crash as long as he wanted at an apartment on Oxford Street. A man named Billy paid the rent. He introduced Terry to his friends and gave him his first injection of heroin. Every couple of days Terry went down to the post office and checked general delivery. After a week he took the suitcase out of the lockers of Victoria Station and back to the apartment on Oxford Street. Billy looked over his shoulder curiously. This is it, this is it, is it? Terry grinned. I hope so. Keep your fingers crossed. I haven't seen it yet. I just hope that Arab in Tangiers didn't double cross me. He took a razor and carefully slid away the lining. It was there. Not exactly three kilos. It came to two and a half pounds on the bathroom scales. Tatuan Tustar had managed to rip him off for half his stash. Still, it could have been worse. At least he had some left. Well, I'll be damned, Billy said in amazement. What are you going to do with it all? Take a little out for smoking, send the rest to Canada, hit it in that chemistry set as soon as I get confirmation. When another week went by with no answer, Terry knew something was wrong. He had already sent a letter duplicate to the first. Neither of them were answered, and neither of them were returned. Something had definitely gone wrong. He broke the keef into 40 weighed ounce bags and stashed them in a locker in Paddington Station. He kept the key with the red plastic handle in his pocket. Soon after this, he came very close to being busted. He had been in London three weeks and been injecting heroin steadily since his arrival. England at this time was operating on the prescription plan. This meant any doctor was free by law to prescribe heroin in maintenance dosage to a confirmed addict. In theory, this would eliminate the black market. In practice, few doctors were overprescribing. Usually, Ladbroke Grove was overflowing with cheap drunk, cheap junk. Us one weekend, though, a doctor who was a major supplier disappeared. The resulting shortage sent the price spiraling, and even then there was not enough to go around. Terry was forced to go downtown to Piccadilly Circus, where the addicts lined up outside Boots the Chemist, waiting for the stroke of midnight so they could cash their scripts. He waited underground in the tube station. Addicts often recognize each other through some kind of sublimal instinct. Terry asked three people if he could score. The first two admitted they used junk but said no. The third one agreed and asked him to wait ten minutes. Terry glanced at the station clock and started pacing anxiously up and down the door floor. Almost immediately he was grabbed by two plain clothesmen, one on each arm. CID, they whispered. Terry automatically put his hands up. Put them down, the tall one snarled. He practically shoved him into a telephone booth. Who was that man you were talking to, they demanded. I don't know. I just asked him what time it was, Terry lied. 
He pushes junk, the small one with Napoleon mustache sneered. Maybe you're the guy he buys it from. I don't use drugs, Terry Buff. Detectives looked at each other dubiously. Empty your pockets. Terry did as he was told. What's your address? 28 Oxford Street. What's the locker key for? My suitcase. I just came to London two weeks ago. I'm crashing around. Keep my suitcase in a locker. The tall one searched his pockets. I guess he's clean, he said. Terry sighed with relief and started putting things back in his pocket. Wait a moment, the short detective interrupted. You forgot his shirt. Pocket. He reached under Terry's sweater and pulled out a disposable shrink. What's this? he asked gleefully. You told me you didn't use drugs. What did you expect me to say? Terry replied defiantly. The short detective brought up the back of his hand and hit Terry in the face. You lied to me, he said, grabbing Terry's shirt at the neck. I hate people who lie to me. They make me violent. Terry didn't say anything. He just stood there with blood trickling down his lips. I bet he lied about the locker key, T, too, the detective added. I bet you he keeps his dope stash there. He motioned to the lockers on the next level. Let's take a look. The keys are for Paddington Station, Terry said foolishly. The detective looked at him. Is that where you keep your dope? I came here to score, Terry said quickly. Look at this fringe. The package isn't even open yet. The other detective nodded. I don't trust him, the short one insisted. We've got a car outside. Let's go check. <laughs>